Our next very special guest, just to add the international flavor to this, all the way from Vienna, Austria, Mr. Klaus Donner. Um, and I think his work will speak for itself regarding ancient archaeological artifacts, mysterious objects, and oopots, and such. Uh, without further ado, the wonderful Klaus Donner. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very sorry that you had to wait uh, so long time, but uh, sometimes technical problems happen. First of all, I would like to say m many, many thanks to, to the organizers of this conference inviting me. And second, I would uh, like to give my greatest respect to two men of your country, Mr. Johann Heine and Michael Tellinger, because what they are doing so, with so much enthusiasm, uh, presenting and researching and spending so much money on, on researching of your own historical culture, researching on the stone circles and on the Adams calendar. So please give them a big action. I think it would be better for many governments to spend more money on archaeological researches than in spending money in war and in armors. Johan, please stand up. Johan, Heine. Please stand up, sir. Johan, Heine, everybody. And please help them to go ahead because I'm quite sure that these uh, uh, researches will go very soon all over the world, around the world. It is a real, real great uh, sensation and I, I had the, the opportunity to see some of those circles and I have to say it's wonderful. Uh, I start my present presentation with some uh, speeches which I found in the internet and I loved it. There is no mystery about who built the Great Pyramid or what the methods of construction were, and the Sphinx shows no signs of water damage. There were no humans in the Americas before 20,000 BC, and I can prove there, there were humans there at least 400,000 years ago. The first civilization dates back no further than 6,000 BC. This is a great joke. There are no documented anomalous, unexplained, or enig enigmatic data to take into account. I will show you some. There are no lost or unaccounted for civilizations. There were. Let the evidence to the contrary be damned. No, we are researching. <laughs> I do not fight against the scientists but I think they should open their eyes and they should uh, research on some of our findings. I think they might find out many, many uh, strange things. Uh, all of you, you know the legends about giants and little people. I was invited 2003 from uh, Professor Wayne Deloria, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. He was the f most famous uh, North American Indian. He took uh, rights against the, the government for his uh, indigenous people, and he was a great researcher. He invited me to a three days meeting with 15 elders of the big North American tribes, and the three days meeting was about giants and little people. Until this meeting, I had never any experience or data or facts about giants and little people. But after that meeting, it really started, and I was very much uh, 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 shocked about some of the findings. You see here, uh, on your right side, a normal human man with about 180 centimeters, and next to him, you see skeletons where we found documents or stories or legions about giants. The one before the last one on the la left side is about uh, 7 meter 60. 
Uh, I got the information that uh, a Father Carlos Crespi in the 1962 was called by people from Ecuador from a mountainside because a heavy storm brought down a part of a platform and they found a lot of destroyed uh, human, uh, I mean, uh, bones. And as they didn't know what kind of bones these are, they called Father Carlos, Cres uh, Father Carlos Vaca who was working in a hospital, and he recognized that these bones are from a human. But he also found out that this skeleton must have been the size of 7.6 meters. Here you see Professor J.J. Hurtak, an American researcher, in front of the big human uh, footstep in your own country. So that means Giants also lived in South America, uh, sorry, in South Africa. Here you can see a photo with some of the bones. Father Vaca uh, recognized some of the bones and he described them. When I found the family, because he, was, he passed away just one month before I could find his uh, niece, uh, she allowed me to bring some of the bones with me to Vienna, and we had several researches in Vienna. Uh, this is a part of the skull, and it must be so old because some of the parts of this bone were already crystallized. This is one of the bones I brought with me, and it was identified by several scientists as a human heel bone. But uh, the professor of anatomy of the Vienna University, he checked the bones and finally he said, I cannot believe it. It looks definitely 100% like a human uh, heel bone, but it is impossible because it is at least five times bigger. Next day, he visited me again and he brought some of the human bones, real human bones with him and he compared it and definitely he said, Still, it's impossible for me, but these are definitely human bones. The skeleton was 7.6 meters in size. This is another side of the bone. Here you have a part of the nose bone, also five times bigger. And that's a so-called os occipitale under the skull bone, which makes us uh, able to turn the, the head it's again five times bigger. We found old documents from a Spanish uh, historian. He was half Inca and half Spanish. Uh, he was writing in 1576. Today we found several human skeletons at the coast of Esmeraldas in Ecuador, and they were all five times bigger than we were. At this time, a Spanish man had the size of about 150 centimeters. He was just a little bit smaller than me. In the Museum de las Culturas Aborigines in Cuenca, we found these eggs. The eggs is 70 centimeters in size. It's granite, very heavy. You can even see where some rope was around it, and it was definitely used. In the museum, of course, it is mentioned as ceremonial eggs. And we did measurements with existing real st stone axes, and the size of this one is again five times bigger. This is another big, like this size, stone axe, also in the same museum, and this is another one like this size. So that means uh, a 70 centimeter stone axe wouldn't have been able to use for a normal human uh, to use it or to handle it. But for a man with a size of 7.5, 7.6 meters, it would have been definitely possible. When I had the exhibition Unsolved Mysteries in Switzerland, we did a model of a 7.6 meter skeleton, which you can see part of it here, and you can see that the big man even didn't reach the knee of this skeleton. Here you can see part of the skeleton and the skull, and the skull we, we had to do like this size, that two men 
could hold it. Here we have a graphic of uh, the, uh, the South African petrified stone uh, footprint, and we did a measurement of a normal man foot size of 1.7 meter. He would have a shoe size of number 41, and on the, on the other side, you see this guy's shoe size, 177, and we measured out that he might have had 1.6 ton of weight. So now, of course, a normal scientist would say it is impossible in that size because the heart wouldn't be strong enough to take care of the blood pressure. But who knows when they really lived. And we have also uh, animals in a very big size. We have plants in an oversize. So why not human could have had a big size? Uh, this is a skeleton of one of the giants they found in, in the jungle of Bolivia in some caves. The size of every skeleton was about 2.5, 2.6 meters. The interesting thing on these skulls is that the jaw is very much stronger than our jaw. The size, of course, with 2.6 meters, they have to have a bigger skull. But, but for me, the, much, the most interesting thing is that we, as Homo sapiens sapiens, we have the fontanella and we have three bone plates. These skulls do not have any bone plate. The whole top of the skull is closed. So that means for me, those skeletons cannot be Homo sapiens or any other known human type. Uh, I hope in one or two months I'm able to fly to Bolivia. We have the agreement with the army that we can visit those places. And then, of course, I ask them to bring at least one or two small bones with me that we can do a DNA analysis and an age dating in Vienna. I'm wondering what the result will be. This is a very huge stone found in a coal mine in USA. The coal in this area is around 68 million years by geologists. And you can see a petrified skull in the stone, which is also much bigger than a model of a human skull seen on the same photo. We had this stone also in Europe. And if you knocked on the top of this skull, you can hear that, this, that inside it was whole. That means, for me, it looks really that this is an original fossil human skull, but also oversized. This is one of several skeletons found in Utah, in the United States. Most of these skeletons had also the size between 2.5 and 2.6, 2.7 meters. If they would have found only one skeleton like this, of course, most of the scientists would immediately say that was a, a kind of sickness because also in our days we have several people which a very big size, with a very big size of 2.5 meters, 2.3 meters, but uh, they are really, they have a kind of sickness. So if it would be just one skeleton, I would agree, but in Utah they found several of them. And altogether very close in some caves. That's another skeleton from the same place, Utah in United States. This is an old photo from a museum in Malta in the Mediterranean. And uh, you see here several very strange skulls, elongated skulls, but to the back side. And a few years ago, uh, these skulls were no more seen in the museum. And a friend of mine, an Italian publisher of an archaeological magazine, went there with the Italian television. And through, with the help of the ministry, they got the allowance to visit the museum. And the director was searching long time until he found in the storage the skulls in a, in a box. 
and he brought the skulls. And you can see here, again, a very strange thing. Normal human, we have three stone plates, and this elongated skull has only one bone line square over the skull. So for me also, it would be very interesting, and I'm wondering why they never did yet an age dating and especially a DNA analysis. It's, it's so far interesting because in Malta, you have also many, many big stone monuments and stone buildings. Uh, dating, archaeological dating is going back several thousands of years, but still, I think those buildings are much, much older than we know until today. Here you have, you can see that the size of a normal skull and this strange skull is quite different. This is my friend Adriano Forgione with the director of the museum holding this skull. So I think these people must have had also the size at least over two meters. In uh, Crete, in the Mediterranean, a friend of mine and very big researcher, Professor Ernst Muldashev from Russia, found with his uh, researchers, because when he's doing uh, researching or discoveries, he's always accompanied by at least four or five different scientists. He is Russia's most uh, famous eye doctor because he did the only functioning eye transplantation until now ever happened. And he is also a member of the Academy of Science of Moscow. Uh, he went to Krita three years ago with uh, his colleagues, scientists, and archaeologists, paleontologists, geologists, mathematicians. So they found uh, underground a huge labyrinth all made into hard stone. The entrance was always from the bottom of the earth going down, then a smaller entrance, and you can see that this entrance was able to be closed with this laying stone in front of the entrance. Also a perfect stone work. This is another entrance to the same underground labyrinth. And here you have one of hundreds of piles, tiles, uh, very high, very big, but perfect done. And the wondering thing is, because an engineer and an expert on stonework told me, if you do a tunnel or a labyrinth or whatever in stone, the stone material which you bring out has to be in volume three times bigger than the empty space. But the very strange thing here on this labyrinth side is then that on top of the earth, it's flat, it's farmland, there are no small uh, stone mountains, which should be because the labyrinth itself is too big. So nobody can explain where the material which was taken out from this labyrinth was, has to be, uh, was brought. This is another photo of the inside of the labyrinth. They also found a perfect room inside this labyrinth. And this is another story with pictures from Professor Muldashev because he was many times in Tibet because of his eye research, and he got friend with uh, some of the monks in Tibet. And he heard about the story of Shambhala and underworld, underground world. And once he was friend with them, they told him about the Samadhi caves. So he asked what Samadhi means. Uh, and they explained him that in this Samadhi caves, they are human from normal size up to 10 meters 
in the lotus seat, the body has zero function, but they are not dead. They explained that these people are connected with a silver string with the universe. And on his last trip, he got the allowance to go into one of these Samadhi caves. He was not allowed to bring light. He was not allowed to bring a camera, but he has to take care one week, uh, nothing to eat, just meditation, and then he could go inside. And he could go so far that he could see the, the silhouettes of, of humans in real different size, up to 10 meters. But then he got headache, and they explained him that usually, if a normal person go, tries to go into one of these caves, he will get immediately a headache, getting strong and stronger, and finally he dies because these caves are energetically protected. So when he returned to Russia, he wrote a book about the Samadhis, but even he was, he is Russian's most famous eye doctor, and even he is a, mem a member of the Academy of Science. Nobody believed him. So when I got in contact with him, and I told him about the bones from Ecuador, he came with an expert to Vienna, and he stayed two days with me, and his expert also identified the os occipitale and the heel bone as a human. So that means that these bones, this skeleton was really 7.6 meter in size. In exchange, Professor Muldashev gave me some photos from northern Syria, which you can see here on this picture. And you see three footsteps. But of course, for the official science, these footsteps are human made artificial made as a kind of ceremony or whatsoever. So Professor Mullershev went, when he heard about these footsteps, he went there again with some other experts, scientists, and they did a lot of research on the spot. They filled in water into the three steps. And you can see if someone walks into a weak soft material, you have two straight footsteps. And then if you make one step ahead and you want to go back in your further position or back out of, the of this material, your heel is making a deeper step than normal. And you can see here that the uh, footstep in front, definitely the heel was going down uh, deeper. So they broke out a part of this so-called stone and they made analysis in Russia and they found out that this is not a stone, it was cement. So it was the approval that really a man, again with a size, according to the footsteps, with a size of at least six to seven, 7.5. Meters. Here you have the real size uh, comparing with the human size. Now we go to Sardinia in the Mediterranean. Uh, there are at least 6,000, some of them in a good condition, some of them completely destroyed, so-called nurages, stone towers, some of them with a size of at least 20 to 25 meters, made with huge big rocks, perfect done. And for the official Italian archaeologists, these stone towers are defense towers. But the strange thing for me and for many others is if you make a defense tower to protect you, your comrades, and your family, uh, against any attack, would you make a stone tower without window, without shooting hole, and with only one entrance? It doesn't give any sense because you cannot defend from inside the tower if you have only one entrance. 
because the enemy just have to bring some wood, make a lot of fire, and he would smoke you out automatically from this tower. Another strange thing was that close to these, some of these towers, there are little hills. And if I would make a, 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 a defense tower, I would choose the small hill because then the enemy has to come up. But many of those so-called defense towers are on the flat countryside. Here you see one of the very good, still very good condition, Nurage. And here you see on top a friend of mine, and you can see how big they are. And this Gruppo Ricerche Sardinia is a group of private researchers, not scientists. But since the last several years, they went to, to some of those important uh, Nurages on many days in wintertime, summertime, autumn, springtime, at the equinoxial days, at the sunsets, at the sun rising, and they found out that these towers had astronomical fu uh, functions. One of the towers is very interesting because there is one hole on top of the tower and only on one day in summertime, on 21st of June, at noon, the sun uh, projects inside the tower on a place where there was a big stone, like a kind of altar. altar. Uh, the, the, the face, uh, I mean the, 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 the light, uh, like a bull. And the bull, in many countries, in, in many myths, uh, myths and legends, has a very important role. And uh, these researchers found out that a star called the bull star was uh, functioning as a Venus in our days before the, the, the so-called flood uh, around 10, 12,000 years ago. But they think upon their researches that these towers are even bigger. Why I talk about the Nuragas? Because in Sardinia are many, many stories about giants, and there are also many caves. Caves, they call it the giant tombs. And those giant tombs have the form like a bull's head. Here you can see this Nurage, where the sun is pro pro projecting the bull's head inside on this little altar stone place, ceremonial place. And in the front, at the beginning of the tower, there are little holes on the bottom of the tower. So also, it would be impossible to use them as a defense because you only might hit your enemy in his feet. So they also checked out at, uh, on 21st of, uh, 21st of June, at the winter solistic, summer solistic, they found out that sunset and sun rising, uh, where uh, the sunshine was straight going through two of these little holes on one side entering, on the other side uh, going out. They made some smoke to see exactly the sun rays, and for them, these Nuragas had astronomical function, but more they don't know yet, but they are still researching. That means you must not be a, a scientist to find some very interesting things, and that's also, again, I come back to Mr. Johann Heine and Michael Tellinger, they are not scientists, but they found out more than many of your scientists found out until today. This is the entrance of a so-called uh, giant tomb. You see, it was a long tomb, and on the left side, right side of the entrance, they were constructed like the bull's head. And around those uh, tombs, very old persons in the age of 85, 90 years 
when I was there at the conference with Andrew Collins last November, they told us that in the 1935, 1940s, uh, they opened some of these to uh, giant tombs and they brought away very big skeletons. So again, an approval for those people because it was not only one man who told this story, but several of them. So it must be reality. I believe in it. This is the entrance of a giant tomb. And this is the top of the giant, of one of the giant tombs. And you can see that we just uh, tried to show if three people are standing around this big, big, very heavy stone, you cannot place so many persons that they even would be able to lift a little bit this heavy stone. So the big question is how and who was able to bring up on top of, the, of this uh, uh, cave, this heavy round stone. This is another entrance of a giant tomb. Age dating, archaeological wise, goes back 1,800, 2,000 years. But then a friend of Adriano Forgione was diving at the coast side of Sardinia and he found on the bottom of the sea one of these giant tombs. That means it must have been built long time ago, at least most probably 10, 12,000 years ago when, when the sea was much lower until today. This is a destroyed giant tomb. And here you can see that also these stone works were done very precisely. Some of the blocks are so perfect, fitting into each other, it looks like the South American stone building stone walls in Sacsayhuaman, in other places, but how they really were done, it's very hard for us to explain until those days, even for the scientists. Then we had the chance to visit the inside of the island, and I was shown this very big menu, which looks exactly the same like uh, the, we saw on the presentation uh, before. And for me, one of the most interesting things was, in the middle of this island, we found stone cuts, rail cuts. You might have heard already then in, that in Malta, were found the same rail cuts in stone. The explanation of the scientists is that it was because they were uh, driving with their horse carriages so long until these stone cuts were done. I don't think that's so easy, and especially inside Sardinia, where nobody is living, only a few farmers, they explained, yeah, the Roman army, they occupied Sardinia, but I don't think that they occupied, uh, occupied Sardinia that long that they were driving with their horse carriages so many times over these stone plates that they could make these deep uh, rail cuts. And another strange thing for me was because there were about 15, 20 meters, these rail cuts, and then was plain earth. And again, after certain distance, again, there were st stone blades with these rail cuts. So that means that in between are missing those stones with these rail cuts. There is no explanation until our days yet. Close by to this place, we found also stone uh, caves, some of them in very hard stone, going back three, four rooms inside the stone. What functions they had, nobody can explain. Another very strange thing in Sardinia is that there were also pyramids. Here you can see one restored pyramid. It looks like the 
Babylonian uh, co uh, constructions. This is a destroyed giant cave, grave, sorry. And then on a hill, we were shown a lot of precise done big stone blocks. And they think, and I can believe that this, these are stone blocks from a destroyed pyramid. But for me, again, a very strange thing is that every of those laying stones on different sides, they have all on one side a perfect crystallization. And uh, an old gentleman there with 86 years, he showed us these uh, strange places inside Sardinia. He brought us away from these sites to a small hill and he showed us uh, a huge stone with several markings on it. And for me, there is a building under earth. And he said, the archaeologists, they are not interested at all to do there any excavations. And for private persons in Sardinia, it is forbidden to make any excavations. Otherwise, this researcher group would start immediately with the excavation. Now we are going back to Professor Muldashev, because he allowed me to show you some of uh, his researches uh, around the world. Uh, you might have heard about the Mount Kailash. Mount Kailash is the secret holy mountain in Tibet where nobody is allowed to climb up. Professor Muldashev and his colleagues' research gave them the result that the top of the Mount Kailash is a pyramid. Then they did satellite research measurements about the height of the Mount Kailash, which is uh, usually known as 6,704 meters. And they found out that the Mount Kailash is 6,666 meters. Then they found out that the distance between Mount Kailash and the North Pole is 6,660 kilometers. And there is a story, a historical legend in Tibet that the Mount Kailash, around the Mount Kailash, was the city of the gods. Further research and measurements gave them the result that the distance from Mount Kailash to Stonehenge is 6,666 kilometers. The distance through the, uh, from Stonehenge to the Bermuda Triangle at certain point, but this is difficult to say, is that, was that the right point, was about 6,660 kilometers and from there to the Easter Island, 6,666 kilometers. From Easter Islands, the distance to South Pole is 6,666 kilometers. From South Pole to Mount Kailash, two times 6,666 kilometers. And from Mount Kailash to North Pole, 6,660 kilometers. So they made further measurements and the distance from North Pole to the Great Pyramid of Giza is 6,666 kilometers. From North Pole to Mount Kailash, the same distance. And between the Great Pyramid of Giza and the Mount Kailash, 4,999 kilometers. That means in all the historical buildings and monuments, there is always a mathematical information included. That's what Professor, uh, Professor Muldashev thinks. And they did a lot of photos with uh, special cameras around the Mount Kailash. And I just want to show the, the most interesting for me. You can see here the numbers one, two, three, four. And you can see that these present half portraits of human in stone in the mountain, and each of these stone portraits has the size of 700 meters. Now, the big question is, 
who would have been able to make stone half portraits into a mountain site with a size of 700 meters. Now we are changing to South America, to Ecuador. There are many, many stories, legends, about a huge underground tunnel system which connects South America from Colombia until down to Chile and Argentina. The most famous story is going about the Cuevas de los Tayos in Ecuador. There were several expeditions already inside, and I was lucky to get a contact with an Ecuadorian who was in the Cuevas de los Tayos with a researcher group and a television uh, team from Ecuador last year and two years ago. And he told me that they could uh, research on 16 kilometers, huge man, man, mostly man made, not everything, but mostly man made underground tunnel system. And he provided me this photo and he explained me that they found a huge hole. You can see the entrance of this hole. It's about 30 meters high and you can see a human but this is only a wall painting. And the little black thing in, next to it, I have to show it. This is the real human, and the big one is a wall painting. And I was really surprised when he told me that this wall painting man has the size of, you got it, seven meters and 50. So now we have a wall painting, we have a huge underground tunnel system, we have an oversized big hall and a wall painting with a size of 7.5 meters so the Cuevas de los Tayos got very famous because Neil Armstrong was with the delegation in the 17s inside the Cuevas de los Tayos. The result was uh, they didn't find anything, but I met a former ambassador of Ecuador, and when he was young in the 70s, he was there in order for the government to check the operation, and he told me that they brought out many wood boxes with something, but he doesn't know what it was. So, the story about the Cuevas de los Tayos came from Juan Moritz, who was a researcher, uh, Hungarian-born, uh, Argentinian, and he was a so-called uh, treasure hunter, and again, I got the, info, the connection to Juan Moritz concerning the giants because when I visited the place where the 7.6 meter giant was found, the landowner told me that after uh, Padre Vaca was transporting all the bones away, he was returning with Juan Moritz and two other gentlemen and they had a kind of technical instrument but this farmer couldn't say what it was and they told him that close by to the place where the bones were found, they, have the, 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 they, they got the result that there are still three big skeletons underground. So we did further researches and we have the guarantee that still there are three 7.6 meter giants underground. And as soon as I have the financing, we will go there and we will excavate at least one of them because before nobody would believe me that human with a size of 7.6 meter ever could have existed. But you have a petrified footstep in your own country with a size of 120 centimeters. Here you have a human dam found in uh, close to Israel. And here is the comparison with a normal on top and this human dump. Also, this human must have been a real big size. This is a drawing 
of a man, of a researcher from Utah, United States. He found a cave, and as he didn't bring a camera, and he's not using a camera normally, he made a drawing of two mummies he found inside that cave. The man had the size of three meters, red hair, and a long beard, and a kind of armor, and a big sword, sword with him. The lady was blonde, 2.7 meters, and he brought out of this cave 60 stone boxes, perfect done stone boxes, and every of these boxes included many bronze plates with a completely unknown writing. And you can see that the boxes were covered with organic material, and the age dating he did on the uh, covering material gave the result of 4,800 plus minus 100 years. Here you see many of the bronze plates, and you can see that the writing, it looks a little bit like the Sumerian writing, but it is completely different. And on this one, you see the ink carving like he did the drawing of the lady mummy. This is another bronze plate from the same stone boxes. This is Rex Gilroy, an Australian researcher who did uh, forms from big footsteps in Australia. And now we are changing to the little people. This skull was found in Morocco in an area where there are fossils and geological dating around 300 million years. Uh, a, a professor found this human skull. They did X-rays researches on it and they are quite sure that this is not an ape, but even an ape 300 million years ago would be a, an impossibility. And the size of this skull is the size of an apple. Here you have the front view of this skull. And another story again with the giants is that uh, researchers found in Morocco hundreds of oversized and very heavy axes. So if one makes a ceremonial X, it's ceremonial means something special. He would make one X, but uh, no one would make hundreds of big stone axes for ceremonial functions. This mummy was found in the uh, Atacama Desert in Chile. We got it to Vienna and uh, several experts, and especially the professor for anatomy of the university in Vienna, was checking it for two hours. And finally he said, this is definitely not a fetus because normal uh, anthropologists will say immediately 14 centimeters, this is definitely a fetus. And he said, as he saw hundreds and hundreds of fetus, he said, this is impossible a fetus because the bones are too concrete, too strong. A fetus in this size would be around five months and the feet were still ar around it and uh, he checked the ribs. This mummy has only 10 ribs, and we have 12 ribs. The skull is very strange. Uh, this mummy has little teeth, so definitely a fetus in the age of five months would not have little teeth. So a few months after, I received the documentation from Russia Ah, the only thing he said, I don't think this, was an, uh, this is an adult. I think because of the bone structure and everything, I think it is a child in the age between four and six years. A few months later, I got, I got a documentation from Russia that an old lady in the age of 84 years, uh, age debil, 
uh, she was uh, going to a small village because she was living outside the village alone in the, in the woods. Uh, she broke down and they brought her to a hospital. And when she woke up, she started crying. She has to go home because her baby would die. And as everybody in this area knew that she is living alone, they thought she is now completely age debil or crazy. And after a few days, they brought her to the, physic, uh, to the psychic uh, hospital. And a nurse there, after a few, day, a few days, uh, she thought there must be something reality with what she is talking, and she called the police. And the police visited the house, opened the door, and they found an, a mummy, exactly as you see this little mummy, but the difference is that the mummy in Russia was 28 centimeters. That means if the professor in Vienna was right, and I think he was right, the mummy you see on these pictures with 14 centimeters was definitely a child in the age of four to six years because in the adult age, it would have the double size and that means the mummy from Russia would have been an adult. So they asked the lady when she found this being, because she explained that it was alive. So she said she found it in, in the woods and she thought it's a child thrown away by the, by the parents and she brought it back home and this uh, being, I would say this being, was only eating sugar water. She explained that it didn't eat anything else but only sugar water, and it was living with her for several months. So we have definitely no explanation what it is. On the documentation, you could see the police you could see the interview with some doctors in this area, but then people from Moscow came and they brought it to Moscow. This is another photo. And the mummy from Russia, I, I'm sorry I didn't bring the video with me, but it looked exactly the same. Also the strange skull, everything same. And it was alive. Here you see the bone structures. Uh, no fetus in the age of five months would have the same bone structures. The fingers also quite different with a normal human finger. Now we go to another field to the elongated, or for me some of them so-called elongated skulls worldwide found. The explanation worldwide was that they did deformation to look like the gods. Which gods? That's a big question. This skull is definitely deformed and was found outside Austria. It, where it came, they don't know exactly, but most probably from Asia when we had in Europe the invasions from the Mongols or other uh, civilizations. This is an Egyptian skull. This shows how in Peru the deformation was done. This is a skull from Tiahuanaco. Tiahuanaco also concerning megalithomania is very, very interesting for me especially and I, am, I hope I can visit it on my next trip because the age dating of the Awanako goes back to 1,800, 2,000 years. But uh, friends of mine, archaeologists in Bolivia, informed me that when they did a ground penetrate radar for the construction of a new street and they sent me the radar photos, they found a pyramid underground and the top of the pyramid was 10 meters underground. So I do not think that in 2,000 years, the earth would move that much up 
that a pyramid still is 10 meters, the, the top of the pyramid is 10 meters underground. So also in Bolivia, there is still a lot to discover, especially about the age of human. This skull is from Mexico in Veracruz. These are all skulls from Veracruz. And this is one of the very strange skulls. We made this photo on a visit 2000 to a small museum in Ica. Ica is very close to the famous Nazca lines. It looks like a real cone head. And I personally do not think this is a deformed skull. This is another skull from the same museum. And the explanation on this skull is a deformed child skull. But look at the bone material. And as you saw before, like they are doing this, the skull deformation with the bindings around the children's head, how could the child's bone getting the double or triple bone material just through bone deformation, skull deformation. I asked many anthropologists, they don't, they couldn't give me a real answer. And especially on this skull, it would be very easy to do a DNA analysis, especially because on that skull, you can see the hairs. So it would be easy to do an age dating and a DNA uh, research. But maybe they are a little bit scared about the result which might come out. This is uh, another collection from the same museum. Uh, the museum, this small museum in, in uh, Ica is called Maria Reiche Museum. Maria Reiche was a German researcher. She spent most of her life in researching the Nazca lines. This is uh, one skull, human skull, at the National Museum in Lima, and they did a model how this human uh, must have uh, looked like. A def deformation to elongate the skull is possible. A deformation with these lines wouldn't be possible because to do this, how you can close the center of your skull with bindings, it would be quite impossible. Now we are changing to the age of human. I know that uh, the cradle of human is outside Johannesburg, and uh, I hope I do not uh, offend, def offend anybody of uh, your people in your country, but I just want to show some of the pictures, some of the researches worldwide, which uh, looks like human were even much, much older. For example, on this picture, you can see a petrified dinosaur's step, and next to it, a human step. But it was not a simple one found, a single one. There were lines of human footsteps and lines of dinosaurs' footsteps. Like you can see on this photo, the human footstep and the dinosaur's footstep found in the Palaxi River in Texas. And as the, the, uh, the, the researchers there uh, showed some of these steps, the complaint from the, res uh, from the scientists was that this was definitely human made to build up a sensation and especially because the finder of those steps were creationists. So automatically, it was human done to do a sensation or to prove that the, the, the creationists are right. But a uh, few years later, it was very dry, and they broke away some of these parts, and you won't believe it, they found under this uh, stone another uh, footsteps from human and dinosaurs. So, uh, the age dating would be go very, very far back in history. Now we are in Ica, where you saw before the elongated skulls. This is 
Dr. Cabrera. He passed away 2003, and I visited him 2001, uh, 2000 and 2001, and we did the last interview with him. On the second trip, he allowed us to photograph and especially to film all this, and uh, we did uh, a DVD with all my material we did in the past, and I wanted to bring some of them with me here to South Africa that you could see more details because in one or two hours you cannot talk, uh, show everything. But uh, unfortunately, the pressing was uh, delay, delay, uh, on delay, and uh, the DVD will be on Amazon next month. So if anyone is interested, you can get it on Amazon. So Dr. Cabrera, uh, his collection, there are many, many uh, email files, or internet stories, f officially, or for the official scientists, the collection of his at least 12,000 stones showing dinosaurs, showing human with dinosaurs, showing medical treatments and everything uh, is officially a fraud. I visited two times his collection. I found out that he also, in his collection, he had some new done stones. That's reality. He was collecting these stones, and I think upon the moment when he couldn't get new ones, he really gave order to do artificial one, new ones. Because on my second visit on the last day, he, said, he told me, now, because we are friends, I really show you my very, very top secret little room. And he opened a little room. And inside were several stones, and one of it was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And I looked at the patina and the other stones, and I know definitely that these stones were done maybe this year, one year before, or two years. So his really biggest problem was that upon a certain date, he gave order to do new stones. But the majority, at least 90% of his stones are old because three years ago a Spanish man, a researcher, a man and a woman researcher, they went to Peru. They got friend with a man who spoke in several TV and newspapers interviews that he did all these 12, 13,000 stones by himself, which is normal for me because if he would have said that he found the stones and he sold it for very little money to Dr. Cabrera, he would have been brought immediately to jail. So he had to say that he did all these stones. Uh, these two researchers got friend with him. They stayed in his area over some weeks. And finally, he brought them out to the desert and he said in this area, he did excavations and he found most of these stones. They started digging on several places and finally they succeeded and they found original stones there with the same strange uh, end carvings like in the collection of Dr. Cabrera. Now this, the big question is, did dinosaurs really die out 60, 65 million years ago or later? And the other big question is, did really human and dinosaurs live together? This is just one side, one part of his museum. Unfortunately, the museum was partly destroyed at the big earthquake hitting Peru a few years ago but his sister is taking care of the collection and she is collecting money to rebuild the little museum. Here you can see one of, I think, the original stones, dinosaurs eating a man, dinosaurs together with human, dinosaurs,
That's another interesting stone showing two persons, a step pyramid and the sun. In my researches worldwide, I always, always, always found the sun, and it's no wondering the sun is necessary for human life, and it had a, had a big role in every civilization, in every human life. But one of the strangest, uh, strangest stones there are the two men with telescope watching some stars and a comet. And many of his stones are showing operations. And of course, Dr. Cabrera was a medical doctor. And of course, the explanation of the scientists against his collection was automatically, of course, he is showing operations on his stones because he's a doctor and he ordered several operations. Here it looks like uh, a very strange operation through the mouth with again two men. And then on the last day he allowed us and he told us he has another very interesting room which usually he never showed the visitors of the museum. In the backyard he opened uh, a door and there was a long room with left side, right side filled with ceramics completely filled. But now, my question was, if he gave order to, to do these thousands of ceramics, terracotta, what was his reason? He never showed them. He never sold them. So, again, showing human together with dinosaurs, and on many of his artifacts, is always showing a leaf, and I was wondering what does this leaf mean? And strange, in many other stone ink carvings from other countries, I also saw several times uh, the same leaf from other cultures, from other time. Uh, what it really means I don't know, maybe some of you might have an idea or some of the persons watching uh, this presentation could give me an idea. I would be thankful. This leaf so many times presented. Here, the fight of a man and the dinosaurs. I, was, I asked him if I can take part of uh, one of those uh, broken statues he didn't allow me. So now, could be that they were new, or maybe they were real old and he didn't allow me, but the idea behind, I don't understand. If someone gives order for thousands of, of artifacts and he puts them away into a room and never shows it, never sells it, there is, for me, no logistic behind it. Also, in these ceramics were presented many operations. And the strange thing is, you can see again here the leaf, and the man laying has a different face like the man who is doing the operation. Another photo of the operation. Here, both of the persons or beings presented have the same face. Here you can see one by one, some of them same, some of them different, presenting different operations. Heart transplantation, brain operations, many things. So this was the Ica collection. And a friend of mine, a geologist, he is now in the age of uh, 70. He spent two weeks with Dr. Cabrera about 10 years ago. And he is really a professional geologist. He was working all over the world, also in South Africa. And he spent two weeks after his retirement with Dr. Cabrera. And he told me what I thought upon my feeling 
that 90% of the stones are really very old, but he has new ones too. Now these photos are from a big collection of over 30,000 pieces from Acambaro in Mexico. Acambaro is a small village and close to the village is a very big mountain, the so-called Bull Mountain. And in the 1930s, 1940s, uh, a German uh, called Julio, uh, Waldemar Julesrud uh, found some of uh, ceramics on this mountain and uh, the farmers there told him that always they found some uh, ceramics and he presented, he, off, he offered them a little money for each piece they bring him. And they made excavation on this mountain and finally in his collection when he passed away, he had more than 32,000 artifacts, terracotta artifacts, showing human, human with dinosaurs, very strange human, some of them looking like Phoenicians, some of them looking like uh, Egyptians and several other civilizations. But the strangest one definitely like dinosaurs. And this was in the 1930s, 1940s. And of course, until today for the official scientists in Mexico, this collection is a fraud. Uh, there were several age dating in United States on some of the pieces and the age dating you will see soon after the photos. All kind of dinosaurs. How could people know about 2,500 up to 6,000 years ago how the dinosaurs were looking? This is a big question. Oh, sorry. This, I just want to show you the DVD in case you might be interested. And I know that I... I have time, more time? I'm running out of time. So I just want to show you the age dating done in 1968 at the Isotopes Incorporation New York. Carbon dating, carbon 14 dating, 3,590 plus minus 100 years, 6,480 plus minus 170 years, and 3,060 plus minus 120 years. And 1972, thermoluminescence uh, research, Univers University of Pennsylvania, 2,500 BC. At least 2,500 years ago, the big question is, how did those people know how dinosaurs are looking like and I have many photos from other artifacts. And if, you, if I would show you these photos, you would say immediately, this is from Egypt. But it doesn't say for me that Egyptians went to South America. There is the other legend, so-called legend, about the sunken continents Atlantis and Mu. And maybe I can show you tomorrow in my presentation on the other artifacts what we think is a, an approval that Atlantis and Mu really existed. I thank you for your time and uh, hope I can see you tomorrow again. Thank you.